This is the You Winning Life Podcast, your number one source for mastering a positive existence. Each episode, we'll be interviewing exceptional people, giving you empowering insights, and guiding you to extraordinary outcomes. Learn from specialists in the worlds of integrative and natural wellness, spirituality, psychology, and entrepreneurship. So you too can be winning life. Now, here's your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, certified neuro emotional technique practitioner and certified entrepreneur coach jason wasser hey everybody and welcome back to the you winning life podcast today's guest is the no bs coach his name is michael sarah he grew up in poland and now lives in london and is working with incredible clients as a coach. We're going to hear about his journey, how he was impacted growing up in Poland, and all the experiences that he had learning how to become a personal development expert. He's been featured in multiple magazines like GQ, and he's been on other podcast interviews. And not only that, but he's also considered one of the highest paying coaches in the UK. All right. Also, I'm super, super excited for this conversation. Michael and I have been having some pre-gaming, some pre-show conversations because I was having foreplay. some tech, some, some foreplay, foreplay. Some, th- some therapeutic and coaching foreplay. So I'm absolutely excited for this conversation with you, Michael. So thanks for hanging out with us today. So am I, Jason. Thanks for having me. So you're calling all the way in from the Queensland of London, England. Is that correct? That's right. Awesome. So I know my we... beloved, my <laughs> beloved city. Not the city I was born in, but the city I chose to live in, and I, 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 I feel that that's the city I'm going to spend the rest of my life in. Incredible. When you and I were talking about both of our shared history, that my on my father's side, um, mm-hmm. both of my grandparents were from Poland, from Częstochowa and Kelts, Kelcia, right? Mm-hmm. And and you're and you're also from from Poland. And yeah, I spent the first twenty two years in Poland, and then last seventeen years here in London. Amazing. Amazing. So when you came over, right? So, you know, one of the things that I love helping people realize is to stop playing small. I joke, I'm five foot two. So I've been playing small my whole <laughs> life. So one of the things I'm like, and then when I see my clients, I've been since the pandemic, I've been pretty much mostly on zoom. I close my office and I'm seeing some people outside uh, yeah. my condo for in person. I'm like, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm a lot taller on screen than I am when you're going to see me in person. Like, what are you talking about? And then they're like, Oh, you really are. So just to give you a heads up. Yes. Yeah, so you don't, you don't freak. <laughs> out exactly so coming from right coming from poland to yeah. london to england right right it's a lot of different countries have different resources have different mentalities have different sure. things that are kind of like culturally acceptable and appropriate and 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 people tap into what were some of the struggles or challenges of embracing newer bigger thinking coming from maybe a small pond to a bigger pond as you started moving into the world that you are in which is an expert coach sure so it was interesting because i'm from a big city in poland i'm not from warsaw i'm not from i'm not from krakow so warsaw will be the biggest city the capital right most people know that krakow will be the second biggest most important city in poland i'm from a city number three called wrocław and it's a big city right so i thought i'm going moving from one big city to another big city little did i know that my quote unquote big city in, in Poland is like a fucking village comparing to London. Right. So, <laughs> so, so first thing that hit me was like, shit, this place is massive. Right. And that's when you get out of the bus. I came by bus because I couldn't afford to, to buy a plane ticket uh, to get here. So 27 hours on the bus and, and then you take the tube, right. The underground, mm-hmm. the subway, as you guys call it. And I think to myself, Damn, this is huge, right? But one of the great things about Londoners in particular, so British people, but Londoners in particular, is that they don't give a shit where you're from, how you look, who you are, what you believe in. As long as you're not hurting anyone, you, you're good, right? So mm. nobody has ever made me feel. Now it's easy because I, you know I've done well. I, I dress like a Westerner as opposed to the way I came here. Uh, dress like you know straight from the boat like i looked like i was straight from the fucking boat right i didn't know it at the time but looking back i looked like straight from the boat but even back then 
even though I looked the way I looked, I could barely speak English. Nobody has ever made me feel um, unwelcome. Right. Right. And and this is something I will always be thankful for um, when I think about this society, British society and London in particular. And, and, and without a doubt, um, I do understand. And, and sometimes British people remind me of that because I do live in in this uh, a little part of the, 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 the United Kingdom called London. And it's like a country within a country. Right. And when I hear about like I had a consultation with a guy from Iraq, I think he was either Iraq or Afghanistan a few years ago. And he was telling me lovely guy. He was telling me he was telling me about how much racism he experienced in some town outside of London. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, what? And looking back, it was just so naive of me to think that there's no racism in, 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 in the UK only because you don't really experience racism in London. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I was sharing that story with like my English client. And he said, Michael, listen, of course, not everybody in this country think the way people in like most people in London think. Right. And I was like, yeah, like I should have known that. But like I was so surprised naively that that Muslim guy uh, experienced so much racism. I, could, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, this is this is not like maybe in Poland or like in fucking, I don't know, but like this, this is not happening in this country. And then, you know, it's just one of those stories that reminded me that London is, like I said before, almost like a country within a country. It's like an island within this big yeah. kingdom. Well, and I think, I think that really tying this directly into the work that you and I do is that sometimes that's where our beliefs, our experiences, our programming becomes mm -hmm. an island within its own island. A story within a story. And a lot of times, one of the things that I work with my clients on is they're talking about this thing that they want to achieve. And yeah. I help them realize that that's actually not the goal. That's just the mountain before the mountain. In other words, if that was no longer there, if that story, that belief, that assumption, that expectation, that trauma, whatever it is, it wasn't there. Sure. What would they then be asking for? What would they then be wanting to work on? What would they be, then be setting their life's course about? Sure. And we all have these presumptions or assumptions about what we think is for us versus what you and I do, which is helping people get out of that way. Sure. So that's a perfect segue because mm -hmm. you're coming in as, as a foreigner from a country that's not far away. And it's such mm -hmm. a drastically different experience for you. And you've been able to accomplish so many incredible things. And now seeing how we help other people, get out of their own way with their assumptions and expectations. So walk, walk me through a little bit. So how did you know that this field coaching was for you, that this is something that you wanted to commit your life to and how did that happen? And what, and what's some of the challenges and what's some of the advantages that you went sure. through on that? Sure. So I've always been interested in ever since I can remember, not, not so much ever since like, I wasn't reading psychology books when I was a child, but mm -hmm. I was reading psychology books. I remember reading Sigmund Freud's, I think it was autobiography, not biography, when I was 16 years old, right? So I certainly wasn't your normal teenager. Right. Um, so while I was chasing girls, so, you know, unsuccessfully most of the time, I was reading freaking autobiographies of, of, of people like Sigmund Freud, right? So the interest in psychology was always there the interest in people in general, a curiosity around all sorts of people was always there. And then at 23, so a year after coming to London, I read The Secret. Mm -hmm. And that was my entry point. That's how I got into personal development. That was the first thing from within the field of personal development that uh, I read or I came across and that really sparked that interest in personal development and then five years later so at the age of uh, 28 so i was working in fashion retail before getting to coaching uh, uh, uh since arriving in london for for a few years and then at 28 i already had a, a strong foundation as far as my understanding of of personal development number one and also a strong foundation for a happy life for myself based on the things I've learned 
through my personal development journey, right? So mm. I wasn't one of those coaches. I remember when I had this calling to become a coach, I went to this free weekend organized by the biggest coaching school, the biggest and oldest coaching school uh, in the UK. And I got there and there were other, I don't know, 80 people in the room. And I looked around and I remember thinking to myself, with some exceptions, all I see is a bunch of fucking losers. How on earth these people, and listen, I love everybody, mm-hmm. right? I always say, I love everybody. I don't like everybody, but fundamentally on a spiritual level, I love everybody. Sure. I don't care who you are, I love you, right? Unless unless you give me a really strong reason not to love you, right? And I could count on 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 the fingers of one hand people who I I I, I you know really really dislike and 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 we we talked about a few before mm-hmm. we started, right? But other than that, it's like whether you're a loser or winner, I love you because I don't think I'm better than you just because I see myself as a as a as a winner and I see you as a loser. But even looking at the body language of of majority there were exceptions for sure there were some really nice people like quote unquote normal people as well but even looking at the body language of some of those people i mean they're just like some of them just like i thought thought myself first of all i don't belong here so sure enough there were those trainers over the weekend trying to sell those diploma certificate courses etc right so there was like a pitch at the end of day two right and I went there because I, I, you know, at the time, I knew I wanted to be a coach. But what I didn't know for certain was whether I need a coaching qualification or not, right? So I, I went there to right, find right. out and see how I feel after doing this free thing, the introduction to, to those diploma courses that they were selling, right? And sure enough, I left with the conviction that I certainly don't need a coaching qualification, and it was interesting because one of the things they asked us to do uh, over those two days was to pair up and coach your 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 you know your 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 partner for right. five for five minutes you know the person next to you for five minutes whatever. So I coached somebody uh, you know I don't remember what it was and and you know it was ages ago but I remember after five minutes this person asked me so how long have you been coaching for? And I said uh, I've, I've never coached anybody in my life. Right. I mean, I it's one of those stories like I've when I understood what coaching was, I realized I've been coaching people my whole life, my whole other life. It's just I didn't know that what I was doing was coaching. Right. right? Even even in in fashion retail, my favorite bit was looking after my 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 people, coaching them Mm -hmm. into being better at the job. I just didn't know it was called coaching. Right. Well, it's interesting because it used to be called leadership. Right. Right. And then this this industry popped up with really sexy titles, executive coach, executive leadership, all these different yeah. things. So a lot of people are generically uh, predisposed to mm-hmm. having these skill sets in them. And what you're finding out, it sounds like, is that you already didn't know that this is what you were already pre-qualified and pre-talented for. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I had this suspicion that probably I don't need a certificate and I knew that I didn't have to have it in order to start my practice because I knew that it wasn't a, a legal requirement. But I wanted to be, you know, I just, uh, it, 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 I didn't want to just be a, a coach. I wanted to be the best coach I could be. So I thought if, if that's one of the things I need to do in order to get there, then so be it, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, I was really underwhelmed with the whole experience. And this is me at 28. If I went there now, to that room with that bunch of people, I, w- I would have to walk away like immediately sure. because the energy was so low. Like the, the, the caliber of those people was, was so low. And on, on the flip side, I thought, well, if this is my competition, I'll have no competition. Yeah. And sure enough, I'm not saying I have no competition in the UK, but I have very, very small competition because there's, there's just very few people um, who call the same co- who call themselves coaches or, or who think about getting into coaching that in my opinion have what it takes to have any chance of succeeding because unless you're gonna put put a gun to somebody's head to pay you the money for coaching you're gonna need to present yourself in a way that will make those people want to pay you right Correct. and and it starts with your personality 
right? And like how you come across, right? And part of that is that body language I was talking about, you know? So if somebody is just like that, I mean, who would want to pay a coach who's just like, you know, the uncertainty is written all over the body yeah. and the face. Well, it's interesting while you're saying that, I love relating this to a multi-topic experience for people who are listening because what you're describing that you walked into and you said like the vibe was bad and the energy was low and mm -hmm. maybe these were people who weren't necessarily high achieving and they wanted to figure out right a lot of times people go and end up doing you know these processes because they want to do it for other people but it's really about their unfinished business in themselves sure, 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 sure. so so yeah. what i'm kind of hearing and kind of discerning for what i love um parsing apart is the people who are struggling with aspects of things in their life is probably because they're tolerating too mm. much of a low frequency. And I don't mean mm. like, you know, like when we talk about low I frequency, right? It sounds very dip, hippy dippy, right? No, but no, no, right. I, but I, you I, and I get it. Cause we, that's our, we use course. that language, but the, but we tolerate too many bare minimum entry level mm. qualifications into our life. And yeah. because of that, the outcome of our life stays at that very low hanging fruit. And I just got off, uh, with a client and we've talked to, I've, I've implemented this idea of, uh, of low hanging fruit versus high hanging fruit into their mind. So as they're going through dating and meeting people, I ask them to tell me about everybody they've met and to put them into a low hanging fruit or a high hanging fruit. And what I meant by that is how easy is that person allowing them, allowing you to be in their life, to be intimate with them, to be physical with them, to be, how easy is it versus is there a pathway? Is there a process? Is it, do you have to work for it? Do you feel like you're, you can manipulate the situation to get what you want. That's a low hanging fruit. So when you're in that moment, you're 28, you're figuring this out and you're like, okay, something doesn't feel aligned. Something doesn't feel as great for me. So I know I can milk what I want from that and then take advantage of it in a healthy way. Walk us through the process. Cause now you're doing this, you're in this world and this is kind of what you're helping other people discern. Mm -hmm. also sure right so i'm not saying that i walked out of that room and i thought i know it all i'm ready to charge even 100 pounds per session that wasn't the case i just knew that fundamentally i had what it took to do well in this profession because as i said you know i, I looked around it's like it, 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 this is my competition yeah and you know me right like i I've never met a coach who wasn't a nice person. I've never, everybody in that room was nice. Every, in, every person in that room was lovely. But just like in the context of dating, if you are straight male, the saying, the guys, uh, the nice guys finish last, right? Nobody's gonna pay you just because you're nice if you are a coach, right? If you are a plumber, if you're a nice plumber, you get good, yeah, that's fine. But if you are a coach and if you want to, make some money from coaches so you can actually do it full time, then just being nice is not enough, right? right. Obviously people expect us, whether you're a coach or therapist, to be fundamentally nice and caring and compassionate, but that's just the starting point. Like I know that my clients, they want much more, they expect much more from me than just for me to be fucking nice. Agreed. They, they, they Agreed. expect me to be nice. That's not like they don't well, there's a, we're a dime nice. a dozen. You and I are a dime a dozen, right? In other words, there and I live near where I went to graduate school is a 13 minute drive. Right. So that means every year, and then there's my program, there's which is marriage and family therapy. There's a mental health program, mental health counselors, and there's a psychology side D program. So that means there's right. three programs every year, multiple semesters churning out graduates. Mm -hmm. Right? So that means within a 30 mile radius, there's thousands of therapists. And then there's two other universities that are 15, 20 minutes South. And then another one that's a half hour South. And another one that's 40 minutes North all have mental health programs, counseling therapy programs. Mm -hmm. So we like, I, I, I agree with you. So one, there's obviously we have to be kind. We have to be nice. We have to be able to see what we need to oh. see. Sure. But I think this is what applies universally to everybody. That plumber can be a really nice plumber, but if they're not, insanely good at what their their craft is they're not gonna go too far right they're not so, gonna go too far so so you know i i why 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 all the coaches and therapists 
I should have some exceptions. I just haven't met a coach that I would consider not to be a nice person, right? But yeah, it, it, you know, why they are so nice, all of them, is because you wouldn't, the way I, I explain it to myself, like you wouldn't think about doing that as a profession if you were a selfish prick, right? right. Just you think about becoming a life coach, right? Like, it just doesn't make sense, right? You, right? you think about maybe like some, you know, some other profession, but not this one. There's a genuine wanting to help other people. Yeah, succeed and, at I, and, some I, and level. I don't question, and I don't, right. I don't question that those coaches they want to help, etc. But to your point that you've made previously. I do recognize, just like you recognize, that many of those coaches think that, okay, I, I can perhaps work or continue working on myself while I'm helping other people at the same time. So I'm not saying that I was um, a finished product when I started coaching, but as I said before, I've already done five years of personal development before I decided to become a right. coach. I was in a good place. And I was cocky my whole life. So yeah. I was cocky. Even I right, so this about, wasn't your right? therapy. This wasn't your healing process. No, absolutely not. Right. I was already a cocky little shit when I started coaching. The only thing that was missing was uh, professional slash financial success, which is something that uh, I achieved when I got into coaching. It took me a few years and you, you know, I just dedicated myself to it. The money followed and... Next thing I know, I'm the highest paid coach in the UK and I have enough money to afford everything I need, right? Right. And I had so much fun but in the process, but I started very small. I started at 20 pounds per session. I had 20 I had 20 clients paying 20 pounds per session. So I had full practice basically before I felt that I'm good enough to charge more than that. Yeah. That I can justify charging more than I didn't feel that it was right for me to charge any more than 20 pounds per, per session, which is way below the UK's average or the, mm -hmm. the, the, the global's average, whatever, world's average for coaching, as you know. Uh, you know, even though I was I was overall a confident guy, I was in a good place, but like I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. So did so you were you afraid you were not providing value over oh, the cost that you I, were absolutely, absolutely. So so to this day, so yeah. I charge a little bit more than 20 pounds per session now, but uh to, to this day it is very important for me that I don't charge more than I believe I can deliver. And I like to think that, and sometimes my clients tell me, so I know that for a fact, I like to think that very often my clients get more value than what they paid for the coaching. Yeah. But I would never, throughout my career, I would never ask for more money than I felt would be the bare minimum of what, of what I can deliver based on the knowledge and experience I had as a coach at the time, right? So as my confidence yeah. would go up, my fees would follow, right? And 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 I started very small and, and I went all the way to where I am now and I'm not done putting my fees up yet, you know? So this same, is- Same, right, uh, same yeah. with me. I have this conversation, I do, I, I had this conversation twice last week with two mm -hmm. different people, someone who's in the tutoring field and they've been right. doing it forever, 30, 40 years. Mm. And they're they're serving higher net worth individuals, right? And they're afraid to charge well, but they have this thing to pay, and they have tuition to pay, and they have That's their story. mortgage. That's Not story. your problem. That's a story. That's a story, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so this is a great opportunity. I think people, like people who are working for themselves, um, or they're working for someone else, whether they want to ask for a raise. Mm -hmm. Or they want to, or figure out maybe if you're listening to this and you are a small business owner or you're a therapist or a coach or in the healing arts profession, I think this can apply to everybody who's not seeing their value. So, is there some questions that you would ask a client if, let's say, they're struggling with this? I want, I need to ask for a raise, or I need to figure out how much I'm actually worth and how much I should charge. What would be some of the questions that you might ask in order to help this? understand to them to, to help someone get to that next level sure uh, you, you see uh, one of the characteristics of my coaching approach is i appreciate that hence you asked that question mm. i suppose that coaches in general ask a lot of questions and through the process of asking questions they lead a client towards the answer yeah. That's not my style of coaching. Mm. I tell people what to do, right? So yeah. I would tell a client, listen, I think you are undercharging yourself, undervaluing yourself. 
I want you to try charging this much going forward. What do you think? Right? So it's yeah. not, it's not, I still ask, you know, what do you think? And if and they just go like, no, 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 then. Well, then, you hear then, the story once you yes, say that. Then, yeah. then I go into negotiation with them. You know, I'm a reasonable guy and all of that. But like, I, I say, listen, I, I was, listen, um, I think you should ask for a pay rise. That's not really a question. That's a statement, mm -hmm. right? Oh, Michael, but I've been, I, you know, and then, so they have like, you know, stories, right? Objections. And then, you know, one by one, I would, you, you know, I don't always succeed at that, but I succeed at it, you know, nine out of 10 times. Whatever objection that might come up with, I say, listen, that's fucking bullshit. And here's why. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sure enough, because especially now after doing it for over 10 years, I can smell the bullshit from a mile and, and, I, and, and, I, and I, you know, build this level of, of experience that allows me to, 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 to overcome just about any objection a client can throw at me. Right. So, so, and yeah, and obviously in, in this process of, 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 of uh, quote unquote, selling people on this idea that they should be charging more or they should be asking for more money or, or they should be expecting more from the partner. Right. So this applies to everything, not just money, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I will, I will talk a lot about, about uh, uh, self-worth and, 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 the the, the 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 idea that i'm convinced uh on which is how you decide your value not the market not not right. everybody else and you know, you, you know let's be reasonable right like i can say oh i from now on i charge a billion billion pounds for coaching right so like i could say that you know and and, and at least one or one or two people wouldn't be surprised. Like, yeah, that's that's something I'm. You know, if anybody could say that, we Michael. But at the same time, I don't want to wait ten years and work with no one until one crazy billionaire is going to pay me a big. You know, because probably it would happen eventually. Yeah, I know well, there is someone clients. who would do that. That's the thousand dollar hamburger exactly, in Hawaii, exactly, right? That exactly, how many you know, so, put it on the menu? Someone yeah, might so, buy it. So Jason, so this is like obviously when I say a billion pounds, like yeah. I am absolutely convinced that I could have one client per year willing to pay the, the exact amount of money I make per year across everything across the board, right? Right. But I don't want to work with one client, right? So, so I know that if I was pitching people at this particular, I would, there would be one person a year paying that. I'm convinced, mm -hmm. right? But then I would end up having one client. And, and, and here's the thing. I fucking love what I do. Right, so it's, it's not about it, it. It's it's sometimes tricky for some people to understand because when you've done well already, and when you say oh, it's not about the money, it's like really, you know, you're saying that from the penthouse in the in a center of one of the most expensive city in, in the world, overlooking, you know, the the biggest landmarks, you know, with a 30k watch on. You're saying it's not about the money. It's fucking not, right? Because if somebody said to me. You can go back to fashion retail and make 10x of what you're making right now. I say, no, thank you. Mm. Let, let me rephrase that. If somebody said to me, Michael, I have a business proposition for you. It's going to pay you 10x what you're making right now. I will only ask one question. Is, is that some sort of coaching related thing? Yeah. No, no, no. It's not. Forget about it. Oh, don't you want to hear it? No, I'm not interested. But it's listen, it's 10x of what you're making right now. And you like nice things. You like, you know, expensive things. I do. But is it related to coaching? No, I'm not interested. Correct. And equally, if somebody said, you can continue coaching for the rest of your life, but you're going to be making 10 times less money than you're making right now, I would still fucking do it. Right? Because so you're it's right. never Spot about on. the money to begin with. Correct. And this is where everything that I talk about with my clients is that purpose and that mission. What are they uniquely positioned to hmm. be adding value to the world that only they can do. And a lot of times it is finding out through their, through their story, through their trauma, through the stuff that they went through, that that actually forged them into a, a really powerful, unique person that if they start looking at the strengths of that story versus the we, right. I'm a divorced marriage and family therapist. And I am, not, I, my clients know it. People who are now listening, if you didn't know this already, then you haven't been listening to enough episodes, people, right? I am not yeah. embarrassed that I help couples as my, uh, my populations that I see. I'm really good at it sure. and I'm divorced, 
Gosh. Right. So I've taken my story and here's what I've learned from it. And here's what I went through. And here's the things I can see, not just from my degree, but I see these signs in your relationship that will get you to where you don't need to be, where I went through. And if that brings mm-hmm. value, then I sure as shit should own my, right. It helps me own my story even more versus being like, I hope no one finds out that I'm divorced. I hope no mm-hmm. one finds out that I'm only five foot two, but I'm working with professional athletes. I hope, right. Yeah. That I, that I work with people that have ridiculously high net worth, but I don't have a million dollars, but I can help people who have net worth of 25, 50, a hundred million dollars in their businesses. Right. So we have, so I think this is exactly what I, uh, what I want people to hear from what you're saying is that, this is just bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a story. And since that's the case, since that's just a story, why don't you pick the story that is prefer, good for you? You prefer, right? <laughs> why don't you, if, if it's just a story and you can pick any story, like I listen, I, I you know a little bit about, about my background and all mm-hmm. that. It, 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 I should in, in like in theory, like on, I shouldn't be where I'm at. Yeah, right? I'm a fucking high school dropout. Well, what story did you have to drop? What what beliefs about yourself did you have to let go of to be who you are today? So 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 I I, I would be lying if I said I didn't have a great childhood and great upbringing. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of money, but everybody around was just as poor. So I couldn't, I couldn't see any difference, you know, I, I, you know, and I've never been hungry in my life, you know, right. unless I was dieting then I was, but I was self-inflicted. Right. <laughs> so I wasn't that poor, you know, it's just a normal Polish, uh, 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 lower middle-class uh, family that I came from. But, uh, uh, in terms of my sense of self-worth and self-confidence in general, that's never been an issue, right? In the context of dating, there was an issue for some reason because I remember I came here and I was, like I said before, a cocky little shit. I had my first job interview and and an interviewing manager asked me how do I see my future in this company. I looked in the eye. I said, I want you. I want like with a broken. I'm not. I, I can't do this accent now. But yeah. in a broken in a broken English, I said I looked in the eye and with it with a finger like this. I said, I want your job as soon as possible like, with a little smile. And right. he laughed. And he laughed, right? And then nine months after that interview, I took over his position, right? Amazing. So, so there was certainly no lack of confidence in general when it came when when it came to my ability to be successful professionally, right? And the same with coaching. Like I knew, I knew as soon as I decided that I will be coaching, I knew that one day I would be the number one coach in the UK, and then eventually one day I'm going to be the number one coach in the world, right? It's going to take me a few years to reach the first goal, and it's going to take me a few decades to reach the second goal. I knew that, right? Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, so that's like my professional identity, if you will, or professional uh, professional side of things. But at the same time, when it came to women, I had that thing, so to, you know, to answer your question, to, I had that thing for years. I don't know from where, I don't know how I got that fucking virus, right? that bacteria, but I had that thing that I can't attract English girls because I'm Polish. Mm. I had that, fu- I didn't have any chip on my shoulder on a professional level, but for some fucking reason, and it's not like, I, you know, I, I I was dating this English girl and she dumped me because she said I, I was the fucking Eastern Arab, nothing. You know, like, you know, the British self-created people, you know. story. Self- no, it was so self-inflicted, made-up yeah. fucking bullshit story that came from I don't know from where. And, but interesting enough, it's like how I got rid of that is, um, at the age of twenty-six, uh, I I got to the point where I was fed up with my lack of success in 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 a in a dating life uh, of mine, and and I decided to do something about it, and and. I uh, thought, hey, uh, since I'm gonna be learning this, I might as well become really fucking good at it. Which is how I apply myself to things in general. It was the same with coaching. I was like, hey, looks like I'm gonna be coaching for the rest of my life anyway. I might as well be the fucking absolute best I can be, right? So the same attitude, the same mindset has been used a few years before in, in a context of my dating life. And as a part of that process of becoming someone who is more attractive to women, um, 
I, I, I started to, to force myself, literally at the beginning, it felt like forcing myself to approach girls that I liked, women that I liked uh, on the streets, like mm-hmm. in fucking galleries, on, on the fucking tubes, like everywhere I went, every time I saw someone I liked, I, I would make myself to walk up to them. And at the beginning it was shambles, like I was terrible. Right. It was, I was nervous. I was too much in my head. It's like, you know, like anyone trying anything for the first time. Right. Uh, I was just as bad as a coach, almost as bad as a coach when I first started. Right. But this one time I approached this girl convinced that she wasn't English because I was avoiding approaching English girls because I was like, what's the fucking point? As soon as she finds out I'm Polish, it's going to be game over. Right. <laughs> but because I, because I had that limited belief. Right. Um, so I approached this girl because she looked like, I don't remember how she looked now, that was ages ago, but she didn't look English. So, so she was like, uh, you know, like more kind of exotic looking, dark hair, whatever, dark eyes. But she was English, but I was like, oh, shit. Okay. So in my head, it's like, okay, this is going to be a waste of fucking time. But like, mm-hmm. I'm talking to her and this girl asked me for my number. Right. So, so, so. So, and you know this, sometimes it takes years of work to overcome a limiting belief. And sometimes yeah. all it takes is one event. And I went in that very moment, I shifted from, I can't attract English girls because I'm Polish to English girls are the easiest for me to attract. Because this was the first time and one of the only times when a girl asked me for my number right. first. So it was just like this. It was from one extreme to another. And ever since I've been like, everybody fucking likes me because up to that point I was like, hey, I can, you know, if I play my cards right, I can attract any woman I, I like. Or I, I have a shot at it, I mean, right. not that I can, but I have, a, I have a shot at it at least, except for the English girls. And then from that point on, I was like, fucking now the world is my oyster and you know. Right. And, um, I, and I think what, while I'm hearing this and I want to kind of break this apart for people who are listening is, you know, when we're talking about being assertive, when you're talking mm-hmm. about being confident, when you're, t- cause you keep saying like, you know, I was a cocky mother effort, right? All this stuff like that. But like, there's a, there is something that is valuable about being assertive. So it's, so I joke that when people are like, Oh, well, what type of therapist are you? I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm an, I'm an, I'm an amazing therapist. No, 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 no. Well, sure, sure. But like, what well, you know, do you do couples? Do you do kids? You do. No, I'm an amazing therapist. Right. That, what does it matter? Do you? What, what is the right? In other words, are you looking either for someone to help you, or you're looking for an excuse for something not to be the objection? Mm-hmm. Right. So, mm-hmm. so I see this all the time. So I want people who are listening to this is that I remember I was at a conference. Uh, it was a business conference, and during one of the lunch breaks. They yeah. sent everybody out to go. It was in Vegas. So you had plenty of people to go and do this at. Right. Um, and um, actually, it was Grant Cardone who did it, uh, right? For his 10X conference in Vegas a bunch of years yeah. ago. And he goes, I want you to go up to people and ask them what their net worth is or how much they have in their bank account. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not my, it's not my business. What my money? We can't talk about yeah, money. But, but you, nuts. right? Yeah. But but yet, if people are here for a business conference and you're trying to solve financial problems for yourself, whether it's as an entrepreneur, whether it's as a business owner, whether it's as an employee, if you are not comfortable taking the conversation out of the bedroom, yeah, that you might not even have in the bedroom or even in, on your kitchen table conversations sure. to the world, and you don't normalize it then how are you going to get comfortable with it? How are you going to be able to talk about it? How are you going to be able to ask for something different? How are you going to be able to, to ask for help about it? So I remember my own story, just relating back to this with finances. I remember when I was 25, 26, 27 years old, I had a buddy of mine that I met at a networking event and he was a financial planner. And I remember he came over to help me navigate some stuff. And I was so embarrassed Hmm. about what I didn't have. I was just finishing graduate school. I was just probably starting. So I had the student loans on one side. I was working three jobs right. and I was maybe making $30,000, $33,000 a year in mm-hmm. 2007. Right. Mm-hmm. And living in a community, which was, you need to have more money to right, like you are in London, right? Um, Florida is also not cheap. South Florida. And I was so embarrassed. I was so, it was like nauseating for me to talk about money, but I'm a therapist and I'm helping people. Right. And that was easy for me to talk about, but the business side, 
what my financial goals were, the audacity to, to the beliefs that I carried about people who had money. Sure. Right. Was so embedded in my psyche because of my own story. And then the, what the work I've done is I have a friend of mine who God bless him is incredibly, incredibly successful. His company is doing over $200 million a year. And he's a, he's now helped other people with their financial success and it's created a book and a podcast about that. And I literally sent him my line items of all of my financial three, two, three months ago. This is all this is my, this is my business, different accounts. It's my, my brokerage account. This is my crypto account. This is my, mm. with no embarrassment, with no shame, with no fear. Nice. So it's interesting to see how we can all go through this because I was the scholarship kid in high mm. school. I went to school only because someone was willing to give me a scholarship. I worked oh. three jobs. I've been on my own since I was 18, right? That's all the story to go to a place where I now have mentorship and guidance from friends who are a hundred X, mm. you know, I love joking that like, Oh, what they, what I made in a year, they're making in a day. Like that's right. And, yeah. and they're really good, genuine people too. Fuck it, huh? Fucking well, awesome. Right? Fuckers. right. God bless them because they're busting their balls and they're doing the right thing in that world. Yeah. So, good for them. So why shouldn't we take guidance and advice from those people and get really, we have to learn how to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Absolutely. And, and as you know, um, better than anyone, the first step towards a change is to recognize there's a problem. And the second step is to acknowledge that there might be a way out of it, right? And, and that's a we come in. And I would say to my clients, I'm saying, listen, you know, I, I appreciate that currently you believe that your back is against the wall in this particular situation. Let me tell you something. There's a way out of it, right? And we say in coaching that... Um, you can never take your client deeper or further than you've been yourself. Uh, and I find it to be true because yes, I don't need to be a, a, a gazillionaire to help somebody else to become a gazillionaire because, because, you know, I, I might be able to still assist someone to become really, really wealthy without being really wealthy myself. But Sure enough, these days my clients don't come to me for for uh, for help with the finances. The, 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 you know, back in the day, I worked with all sorts of different people, but my my, my quote unquote typical client today is already financially okay, and the focus on our work is primarily on making sure that the happiness level, the fulfillment level, matches the level of the wealth. Right to, to put it to put it simply, right that, to align know, to, those two things. Yeah, together. yeah. So right. the, the the wealth is there, but the hap, that the happiness is not not non-existent, but it's it's like medium, right? Like five out of ten, right? Yeah. It hasn't caught up yet. It's not. Yeah, insane. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is just something missing, right? And when there's something to do with relationships, and when I say relationships, starting with the relationship they have with themselves, right? Or relationships in the more general terms, or the, fit, the fitness and health. Whatever it is, we look at all areas of the life, and, yeah. and 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 more often than not, they know exactly what they need help with. And if they don't, we find out what they need help with, and then we work together as a team uh, on on uh, turning that around, right? And then the goal is uh, for everybody I work with to reach what I consider life mastery, which is being happy, wealthy, and healthy all at the same time. Right. I'm not impressed. I, you know, I remember like as a young man, like, oh, this guy is rich. Oh, this guy has a beautiful wife or girlfriend, whatever. And then, you know, in my 20s, throughout my journey, I remember thinking to myself, I want all of it. And I'm not going to stop. I, I knew that even though The Secret was the first book that I read, like I said, I, I was just about smart enough to know that sitting on my ass and visualizing shit, it's not going to cut it right so i had to actually do the work but you know what they say about polish people we work hard so work ethic has never been a problem so right. whatever goal i set for myself i put a lot of a lot of a lot of hours a lot of sweat not so much tears blood and sweat and you know uh, 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 and occasional tears to to do whatever I had to do in order to get what I wanted, right? So nothing's been ever given to me apart of a lot of love 
growing up, which I suppose, you know, one could argue is the most valuable thing of all. But other than that, nothing's been handed to me. I had to work for everything myself. And guess what? I really enjoyed the fucking journey, right? Whether it was learning how to become the best coach I could be here in the UK or, or, or becoming better with women or, or getting myself in the best shape possible. Yes, I enjoyed the, 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 the you know, the benefits, the, the end goal, the, 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 the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But I also enjoyed the journey, right? Because if you, if you work towards something that you enjoy, so, so if there is a goal that you have, and you're dreading the, the, the journey, probably that's not a goal you want to focus too much energy on, right? Because I didn't want to set ourselves goals that, yes, if it's a fitness goal, like not, not many people enjoy like going on a crazy diet and all of that. But, but, but if you get really excited about that goal, then you can at least try to get excited about the journey itself. And especially when it comes to goals like uh, making more money or, 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 or creating a great relationship with someone, then, 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 you, you, by all means, you, you, you want to do it in a way that you can, you can, you can, uh, you, you can uh, have a cake and eat it too. So yes, you get to that outcome at the end, yeah. but you enjoy the process. You want to enjoy the process. So I remember the first two and a half years of me working as a coach. I didn't take a day off. I didn't go on any holidays. I didn't drink. I didn't date. That was the biggest sacrifice because I knew if there's one thing that can distract me, if there's one thing that can take me away from reaching my goal is women, right? Because I just like them too much, right? So <laughs> I've never been, I've tried all substances imaginable, but like, you know, like there's still that one. <laughs> women is my favorite quote unquote substance, right? So I knew that if there's one thing that can take my attention away from the fucking goal, yeah. it's women. So for two and a half years, I've been pretty much even like a monk because I knew what the goal was. The goal was to become a six figure coach, the highest paid coach in the country. And I was willing to do whatever it took, right? So yeah. two and a half years, no holidays, no days off. I was working seven days a week. In 2012 alone, on top of my initial consultations and sessions and all of that, I've organized and given around 200 talks just to give you an idea of the intensity of that period, that first two and a half years before I, I reached that six-figure level, right? Right. But what I'm going with this, it sounds like, oh my God, this guy has sacrificed so much. Oh my, no dating, no drinking, no party, no days off no holidays for two and a half years. What kind of life is that? Jason, the best two and a half years of my life. Yeah. I, I fucking I love it. every minute of it because I, I just, you gotta enjoy the journey. Right. And then it's and like, I, I literally had this conversation with a buddy of mine. He's in New York. Mm. Great guy. And we talked about the pullback from the last two and a half years of the pandemic here. And he's in New York. Yeah. So they're more strict than they were in Florida. Florida is like the wild west. Um, yeah. And New York was very, very strict. And it's lots and, of New Yorkers. Uh, they have all moved to South Florida, right? They're yeah. all here. So yeah. please, go, please go back to New York. Um, so <laughs> off, off you go. Um, off your, off we're again. done with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Shoo, shoo. So, um, but we talked about the value of how I realized at front, how I used to be, both were super involved. We actually met through our social circles for different right. retreats and conferences within the, within the Jewish community. And I'm like, dude, I haven't been involved in anything in the last two and a half years. And I was speaking at these things and running meditations and doing the coaching therapy thing. And, and I was a public figure and I just disappeared. Right. And if people didn't see my social media about my podcast or my practice, they would not know that I exist. Right. But what they have been seeing is I'm running a Zoom class on mm -hmm. this thing and I'm doing this thing tomorrow on marketing and I have all my podcast episodes and all of the stuff that was so singularly focused that I realized how much people show up to events, not because that there's a goal for them, not because there's a healthy aspect of it, but it's because they don't realize that they just want to stay relevant. Right. And if they become irrelevant, what does that mean as far as their ego and their identity? Couldn't agree more. So I realized for the last two and a half years, how much happier I've been when I'm seeing stuff on social media. And I'm like, mm. ah, these people just don't align with my values in the first place. Mm. Why was I continuously going to events 
that I didn't care to go to, even when I knew I didn't care to go. But now I've, sure. and I can use that pandemic as a legitimate excuse to just disconnect, but also take that time to work on myself. And I wonder, and this is something like, so like when you and I talk with our clients and like, well, we want to see where they start and where you want to see where they end up. But how many people did not take this opportunity over the last two and a half years to go inward? To right, everybody being, oh, I bought a Peloton or I bought this or I'm doing more reading or I'm doing more cooking or mm-hmm. right, all this stuff that everybody did the pandemic. But, but there's people that I bumped into and I'm like, oh, I really hope something changed for them over the last two and a half years and they're the exact same person that they used to be. And we're missing out on opportunities. I think that's one of the biggest things for this difficult time is that mm-hmm. people took there's people who took advantage of the opportunity to go inward yeah. and become more self-reflective and work on their self and people who just Oh, I miss being social. I miss going to events. I miss being that version of me, of how people can see me versus who am I really? Listen, I I I can't think of anyone. I'm sure if I if I thought about it really hard, I would think about one person at least, but I can't from the top of my head think about a single person I know who isn't better off. Not because of the pandemic, but now relative to before the pandemic, because it's it's they in my they just adapted, right. and that includes a client who's a serial um, restaurant slash pub owner. So he had I can't remember now, I think nine restaurants and pubs before pandemic, and now he I bumped into him uh, the other day actually uh, on my way uh, back from the gym. And I think he has. He said he has twelve now, because 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 he was he successful. O- obviously, obviously, like it wasn't great news for like especially restaurant owners at the start. But he was already established. He's a smart guy. He's a capable guy. And when you think about it, this was a great time to get new places leases for new places at good prices correct because they were everybody and he had some cash so he was like being the smart guy that he is he knew what most people knew which is that this pandemic is gonna go away eventually yeah so he was just buying and some people not me proactive strategy nuts right this guy was buying he was buying locations for restaurants in the middle of pandemic Correct. Some people thought that he was not. I thought he was a fucking genius. I agree with you. And I think that's really what I want people to hear is, is that we're, we're either being proactive or we're being reactive. Mm. For me, the proactive was the writing was on the wall of March of 20, whatever it was. And mm. within the weekend, I was running a retreat for young, uh, young, for young, young entrepreneurs with a yeah. buddy of mine. And that weekend, that Saturday night, I sent an email to all my clients your, your session is still on. This was March. So this was like right a few weeks yeah, before yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. But people, I but yeah. I remember like those people I knew that already were in the hospital here in Miami. Right. Right. So no one knew what the hell was going on this time, right? There was no mask at this point. I was still flying, but like Target, the store Target, right? The convenience yeah, store yeah, had, yeah, yeah, yeah. had like pallets of Windex wipes out in the middle of the store, right? Pallets, right? Of just right. fact. So no one knew yeah. what the hell was happening at this point. And I immediately, t- I made that executive decision. Our, our sessions are now going to be on Zoom. And I, I, I shared it not as like apologetically, but I shared it as in order to be the most successfully proactive for all of us to make our lives easier so we don't have to worry and we can take one chaos thing off. Every session that is scheduled is still on. I'm not canceling. I'm not changing. I'm not moving anything. Assume mm-hmm. your schedule is still on. You're just going to show up here. Here's the link. Of my full caseload, only one client who was non-committal to the therapy process in the first place was the person who dropped off. One client. No one else. We were, we were talking, I, I hear you, we were talking before we started recording about mm. us being mavericks, you and I. Yeah. So you see, I I, I I took it a step further. I I, I run you know, business as usual. I, I said to my clients, I know there's a lockdown. And technically, you're not supposed to leave the house unless, you know, but you can still come to my house if, if you know, I'm, I'm, you're welcome. If you, if you want to come, obviously, we can move it to Zoom. And there was only one client who wanted to move to Zoom. Everybody else was still coming here because, because yes, they knew they were breaking a rule. And I was, mm-hmm. I was, uh, I, you know, I've been breaking rules my whole fucking life. So to me, that was just like another, just, you know. I was like, hey, listen, I, I totally understand if you want to move it to Zoom. I'm absolutely cool continuing face-to-face. 
we can social distance if you want. If you don't, I don't care. I was fortunate in a way that I, I had COVID right at the start, right? So I was like, oh, this is, and I knew it was COVID because I couldn't smell anything. So I knew this is not a regular cold, right? So I got it out of the way. I was like, yeah, I've, it didn't kill me. Obviously I was still there. And, 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 you know, like, like I said, everybody or almost everybody continued coming here, seeing me face to face because most of my clients, not all of my clients, but most of my clients are, are London based. And, 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 and some of them were, were in, in, you know, medical professions and, and sure enough, because those guys understand viruses Science. better than the rest of us. Right. They were the least concerned about it because they were just right. like, it's, well, the it's way a virus, just exp- it, right. it, it sucks, but like, it, you know, we're not, we're not all going to die, right? Right. There are they, knew it. They, they knew what we knew that, you know, it's, it's, it sucks, but like, you know, let's, let's try to continue uh, with, with right. this normalization know, of whatever it may be. Right. But the word that you use to describe is I was fortunate enough to get it early on. So, right. Yeah. And, and I think that goes back to the binary ones get and zeros, way, you know? right. To get it out of the way. So, mm-hmm. but, but if we look at our, uh, if we look at our challenges, our experiences, I, I'm fortunate, like, you know, it's not like I'm not embarrassed about yeah. that, what I went through in my relationship. It's, yeah. it's, it be, it was awful awful that whole stage of going through that divorce was awful and i don't wish that upon anybody even if it's even if it's the healthy thing to do it still is fucking awful but now looking back i don't have any negative energy i don't wish anybody ill will i'm like it's such a clean peaceful place and i'm fortunate that that forced me to do certain work on myself and for myself that has nothing to do with the cause or effect of the their side of the coin but only to take ownership and accountability of my side of the coin. And I think that's kind of at the end of the day, everything that I want my clients to hear is it doesn't matter what's going out on in the world. What are you accountable for? What are you taking ownership over regardless of what you see anybody else do differently or not? Totally, totally. And just there's, there's one thing I say more often than all the others in my coaching in life in general, when I talk to people, it's just be you, you know, like as long as you don't hurt anybody, just freaking, you know, know, that's one of the things I love about London. Like nobody gives like, as I was saying before, nobody gives a fuck. If you are black lesbian with a fucking piercing in in, 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 all over your ears and your nose and your lips, nobody gives it. Nobody's like, no, nobody even like, pays attention to it because it's just such a normal thing to be whatever, whoever you want to be. And well, punk, and, right. And, Think about the punk, like, the punk movement came out of where it came out of New York and it came out of London, right? That was they, the punk. Right. So, so right. There's all right. So, but that, those are Mavericks. Those are people who, yeah. who have embraced. And, and, and maybe this is the sum of our conversation is that when we learn how to get rid of the stories that we've been telling us, so we can truly embrace who we authentically are then maybe we all might realize that we're Mavericks. We all yeah. might realize how talented or how, and I don't mean like unique, everybody gets a first place trophy. I'm not talking about that, but that everybody has a unique purpose to serve. Totally, totally. You see, I've never felt that uh, I'm somehow special, right? And because I'm so special, I will have all those amazing things in my life. Yeah. Well, that's narcissism, I, right? Those are narcissists. Sorry. The people who believe yeah, that yeah, are the exactly, narcissists. Exactly, right. exactly. So I, to this to this day, you know, no matter how cocky I might sound when I say certain things, I, I'm i as humble as I'm cocky, right? Like I know myself, right? And everybody who knows me knows that it's that combination of those two things at the same time. Um, I, I don't think anybody's better than me, but equally, I don't think I'm better than anyone, right? Um, so <clears throat> what I was going with is, I never felt that I'm special and, and, you know, I'm going to change the world. And like, especially when I hear like somebody in personal development saying, I want to change lives of a million or 10 million or billion people. I'm like, shut the fuck up. You know, like, like really, really. All right. I'm a, listen, I'm a good guy. I don't wake up in the morning thinking if I could only change the lives of 1 million people, it's like, come on, just give me a break. Just, just stop repeating those freaking uh-huh. cliches yeah just agree just, and, and then and then you know you learn about this person and then and then his own girlfriend or wife or daughter will tell you that he or she is an asshole yeah. and it's like he, they're talking about like i want to change just why, why don't you start with your fucking neighbors 
you know, there's a, you there's a therapist. I was reading through psychology today. I bear, like, I get like rant, like I don't know whatever reason I get this subscription and, um, or psychotherapy, I don't know, whatever, some psychology magazine that I get, I'm flipping yeah. through it while I'm in the bathroom. Listen, whatever porn magazines do it for you, Jason. Right, 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 right. It was psychology. Yeah. It was definitely not. It was just sitting there, right. It was just sitting there. Like, magazines, you know, you guys, you guys are like, you know, self-indulgent. It's self-indulgent. Yeah. I literally you know, has been sitting on my counter. For yeah, a week, have you for seen the last issue of the therapist magazine? Oh I my even, god, I don't even read on the cover. Yeah, right. I was like, right. Look at me. I was just flipping through because I was just because it was something about uh, the one of the articles was when someone, uh, how do you help someone? I was talking to a client about if they believe that someone in their family or someone that they love or care about should also go to therapy. How do you talk to them about helping them to help a person go to therapy? Cool topic, right? Or so like, how do you how do you know? Hey, man, you might need some coaching on that, right? A cool topic. So that's what I was flipping through. But then I saw on the side panel on the thin side bar there was an ad for a book. And it was something about like narcissism and I know the author and I'm like that mother effer is one of the hugest. That's my arch nemesis. That's my magneto to, to my professor Xavier. Right. I know how unethical this person is. I know how many times this person has lost their license and got it back. I know the right. dangers of people who, who have worked with them as a client and have, or people who have worked with this person as a therapist. Mm this person is a narcissist and he's writing a book on how to identify a narcissist. Like, and I'm just like, do I call the publishing company and say, do you realize the danger that this person and are you, have you done your due diligence? And I'm like, what am I, what am I bringing? Like, where's my energy right now? What am I attending to? Speaking and, of authenticity, you know, right? I mean, it's yeah, but, uh, Right. I got to let the universe sort that out. Not me. Yeah. Like that's my yeah. own choice. Why am I so bothered by this? Hmm. Mm. And we all have this. We all do this. Totally, totally. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm the person to say I judge people all the time. Um, except that uh, I like to think that I judge them only on the merit of the character. Correct. Um, as opposed to, you know, skin color. Right. Religious, religious views, sexual orientation. You know, I, I couldn't care less about any of that. But I do judge people all the time. Oh, but you, I like what you shouldn't judge people. Listen. I do whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> That's what I do, right? You have right. a problem with it? Like, talk to me when I break the law, like properly break the law. I don't, I don't talk, I don't mean like not wearing a fucking mask at the airport, you know, that kind of yeah, rule. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk to me when I really break the law. Then it's like, fair enough, right, right. which which I want because I know what the law is. Plus like, hey, you know, I, I, I'm not really into like murdering anybody. Like, it's just not mm -hmm. my thing. It's not my kink, right? right so, right. But, but, but beyond that, let me just fucking decide. It's like I said something on Facebook the other day. Something along the lines like how I would pay to to you know for for the Putin's head or something like that. And this and it's on my Facebook, right? And and this guy, which I don't know, like it certainly wasn't my client because my client, you know, they don't they don't talk like that because they just like they would probably, you know, hey, do you want me to chip in? You know, like it, it took for that bounty for for Putin's head. And somebody said, oh, you 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 can't you can't say that. Like you, you can't say like you can't talk about like killing people on. I said, I said, uh, uh, you know, and that's like you know him commenting under my post on my Facebook, right? And I said, oh, of course I can. I just fucking did. Mm -hmm. I like I I like I I I do me. You do you. And as long as you doing you is not hurting me or somebody I know or people in general, I have no problem with you. You just do you. Do whatever fucking makes you happy. Don't let anyone, including myself, even if I'm your coach, telling you what to do because you wanted me to. If you don't agree with what I'm telling you, don't fucking do it. Right. Don't be a fucking shit. Be a maverick. And, and I agree with you. What you said, the how everyone is a is a maverick to a to a less or greater degree it's just the difference is not like oh you know you have to have a certain type of personality it's like oh it's easy for you to say michael because you're an extrovert it's nothing to do with me being extroverted right it's about having the balls to leave your life on your terms it's yeah. about having the balls to 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 allow yourself to be yourself to express yourself the way you want to express yourself whether it's through fashion if you are uh, you know it's obviously my there's nothing controversial about my fashion uh sense like i know that it's just like you know normal right but i know that certain things that i say or have said in the past would wrap people off the wrong way sure. and i 
I and I knew it's gonna happen before I even said those things, right? So it's not like I was surprised, but I was speaking my truth, right? And I take criticism and rejection of some sort daily for breakfast, lunch, and fucking dinner. I have no problem with that. I got I got so used to being criticized and rejected and 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 you know and it, it, and, and I've been called too honest in the past. Right? I've been I've been accused of being too honest, right? Right. I have no problem with that. You will find people who would say this guy's too honest. Like he talks too much. He he he, he his mouth is too big. I have no problem with that. But you're not gonna find anyone who's gonna say I'm dishonest, mm, right? Because yeah. even my ex-girlfriend, one of my ex-girlfriends who caught me cheating, I owned up to it, and I was like, "Yeah, I fucking, I yes, you you got me there." Yeah, yeah. But, you know, well, I think that's the, I think yeah. that's where right at the end of the day, integrity comes in. Where it's, <sighs> I tell this to my clients, where I'm like, I don't care who you voted for, I don't care who you slept with, I don't care who you slept with while you were voting, don't be a dick. Exactly. Just don't be a dick. Exactly. Right? I don't, uh, everything else, is, I have friends who are one, the complete ops. I have one of my clients who I adore, uh, mm. one of my coaching clients. We are so polar opposites politically, but yet mm. I can start off a session with a joke about my side. Sure. And making fun of my side of the things about what's going on in their local politics. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know so and so was. And I'm like, you know, and that's where, like, where, where you know that there's so much more commonality. Yeah. In those things. And also it's the idea of like, just not taking it personally. Like I love talking about making things inconsequential. So whoever in America, so if a certain president becomes a president again in a couple of years, okay, I still have all the things that I need to work on and control and I can handle and I can be with my clients and the things that are the highest priorities for me. I don't have control over that at the end of that. I do my due diligence and that's it. But if I'm going to spend like everybody does on social media, bitching and moaning and complaining and this and that and spending, I'm like, ah, do these people, how do these people not have, how do, do you have a job? Do you have a mission? Do you have a purpose that is bringing more value to the world? How are you spending all these days at these rallies and and and, and posting shit on social media that is just divisive versus uplifting? They think it's uplifting, but right on both sides. I'm talking about both sides of the coin. I'm like, don't you have a job? Don't you have a meaningful that you have to just not jump onto this divisive thing in order to make your life a value to to see which camp you align with so you don't feel alone and lonely? But that's what we're dealing with. That's why you and I will never be out of business. I have, because absolutely, we, no, I have absolutely no doubt because, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, you know, I, I was doing okay as a coach for the first year and a half, just fine, just like everybody else who's doing okay as a coach. And then I had this realization, right? So a year and a half, then I had this realization. Hmm. Nobody criticizes me. That's yeah. a problem. Mm. I'm playing it too safe. Yeah. And yeah. that's when I became the, the so-called no bullshit coach. And all I did was I brought more of my personality, which was already there. And it's always been, quote unquote, no bullshit. I basically brought it to my coaching. And guess what? My business has skyrocketed. Yeah. Because no matter how, I mean, you know, without getting too political, I mean, how crazy was your former president and how many fans does he have? Correct. So you can be, you can be, it shows that you can be this crazy and this orange and still do well in life. Correct. Right? So one because thing, I'm, everybody I'm, aligns with what they align with. Yeah. So, right? so like, you know, if there's, if there is, there's not many things I can, I can respect about, like, I respect about that guy, but, but, but damn, he did well. Everything considered. Correct. He, he right. got the biggest, he got the biggest job in the world somehow. So I can't be like, I can't you can't hate on that. you can't hate on everything, right? Everybody has yeah. something that they're. And I remember right, tying that back in. I remember when I started doing all these Zoom coaching classes, these group classes during the pandemic. So I leveraged that, right? Well, they're it's captive audience. Yeah. And a friend of mine want like was so excited about my class and like, oh, I invited so and so, another person that we know, and right. she's like, I she's like, why are you going to listen to him? He's divorced. <laughs> I'm like, or I don't have a fear of commitment. Cause at least I tried it. At least right. I went all in on it. Right. So I'm like, great. But I also know that, that, you know, like everybody has a story. Everybody has, like you said, their objection, their, whatever it was. I also turned down that person from, I wasn't, that person approached me about 
you know, sure. getting to know each other at a deeper level. And I was not interested in any way, shape or form about that person. So is that showing up and why they're saying that? Or was there a rejection? And I'm like, okay, cool. They're probably they're, that not, but yet all these other people are showing up for it. So they created their own objections to get any value. Mm-hmm. And for me, like, and I tell this to my clients, um, right. Those, especially where are different politics. I'm like, well, I listened to your guy the other day. I listened to this podcast. I listened to this, this person on the other side of the political or philosophical spectrum. Cause data is data. Knowledge is knowledge. And I have the right to sift and sort through it, but I'm open to hearing the other side. I'm Absolutely. not going to reject because I'm sure there's some really amazing, brilliant stuff there. And there's some stupid stuff on my side and there's some brilliant stuff on my side and there's stu- my side as if I own it. Right. See how we, we even talk about it. Languaging wise, it's not my side. I've chosen through a series of experiences and data to sift and sort to where I'm at right now that will continue to evolve. But the idea is to exactly the idea is to be open to, I'm always open. I have my opinions about just about anything. Yep. And some of those opinions are really strong, but at the same time, I'm always happy to have my opinions challenged, my right. views challenged by Just, myself and by other people. Exactly. Like, yeah, as long know, as they're not a dick about it, pour me a yeah. scotch. Let's and have I'm a scotch. More, right. And I'm more than happy to change my mind about stuff. And in fact, I change my mind about stuff. Yep. In, 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 in Poland, there is the saying that only a cow doesn't change its mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know and since i'm a human not a cow i'm like hey listen the fact i believed in, in that last year it, it's something ray dario said he uh-huh. said um uh, if if you don't think you were stupid last year it means that you haven't worked hard enough like you haven't evolved well enough if you yeah. don't think at least like parts of your behavior from last year are going to trickle stupid, in. Yeah. Stupid. It means that you just, you don't, you don't grow fast enough. Mm-hmm. Right? I host, I, I put together an accountability, a retreat for my accountability group. We meet every week for an hour yeah. and then every quarter we meet for four hours. And then now I convince them to do a once a year in person. Right. So we did it uh, in December and I said, we were sitting at lunch. I'm like, guys, I really serious about this. If we are ca- talking about the same shit next year that we're talking about this year, we did not do the accountability group. Right. Mm. And mm. I want to let you know that if majority of us, including me, aren't doing are, are still talking about the same stuff then we need to disp- then there's not going to be another we're not going to continue the accountability group mm. that's what that's the level that we I'm call it a day yeah we're calling it a, that's the i want to be proactive and say that's what the level i want to be playing on if you're not wanting that then i know i'm in the wrong accountability group and if i'm not bringing myself to that level then i know i'm doing something wrong and i need to figure something out because i don't want to hold you guys down and that's the right that's what really I think that's kind of right. That's why I love doing my podcast because it's about letting people uh, mm. into some of my thoughts and what I'm working on and how this is not about me telling people what to do in that regards mm. of like, not the way they, not, I'm not saying like that you're doing this. Well, but I'm saying me. like, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do, I'll right, right, right. I'll leave that to you. I'll do the no, no, but like, work. but it's, 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 it's Exactly. No, but it's, but I don't, I'm even saying it from that perspective. It's just like, sure. have you thought about this? Did you know this exists? Did you know that yeah. people out there who've gone through similar things to you have accomplished this? What is, what's the reason and stories and, and, and tools that you might not have even known existed? Because mm-hmm. I'm you, for me, this is really a selfish undertaking. I get to meet really awesome people all over the world that I would never have access to if I was sitting in my little office in my second bedroom in my apartment in Fort Lauderdale. Mm. So really people are just getting to hear my watered down, right? Thought process and take advantage of that if they want to take advantage of it. But this is purely selfish. If they're smart enough to want to take advantage of it. I would yeah. 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 However it is. So good. All right. So we got to We got to call it a day. Cause I, I, you, you're, you're, you know, well, it's still late out there, but I got my, my next step of, of clients. Sure, sure, ready sure, for it. But sure, Michael, sure. I really want to thank you. This was, I, I love the rawness. I love the, this is definitely going to be a very different episode than um, a lot of my other episodes, but I think that's why it's so unique to have someone like you, who's right. You said the no bullshit and right. We're not, we're not putting on a pretense. We're not putting on a mask. We're not putting it mm. for the sake of social media. It's, it's raw. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not seeking controversy. I'm not trying right. to be provocative. I'm just being no. myself. And Correct. sometimes some people find it controversial, provocative. Yeah. yeah. That's up to you. Like I'm just being, I'm just doing me. And and, I know. and, and, and anyone listening to that who already knows me like, yeah, that's like, that's how he sounds every day. You know, right. that's, that's well, it's the 80, 20 rule, right? If you, if you piss off the 80%, but you have the 20% that really love you, those yeah. are your people. Yeah. Right. And that's I, your tribe. You know, 
and that's it's like yeah like i said i love everybody but i certainly don't want to coach everybody i don't i don't want to date everybody you know i just right. i just want to you know love everyone from a distance but but be surrounded by quote unquote my people and my people yeah. find at least most of my jokes funny you know so i don't even like can i say this or will i will i offend someone if i tell this I joke can i, can I, I tell a racist joke can i tell a can I tell a sexist joke? Are they gonna are they gonna think I'm a sexist? No, my people know that I'm not a sexist. Right. If I say a sexist joke, it's just a fucking joke. I know. There was a friend I had who I think is they're they're such a lovely person, but I, I had to be a different person. I couldn't tell any of my like I couldn't just be like I couldn't just be Yeah. And me. it's tiring. Is it is it's that exhausting tiring? Because, have, because, like, because especially for a nice person, like you said, because if you're at a dick, you're just being a dick and you don't even care. But right. Because you but guys, I care. You don't want to. Like, I don't right. want to offend anyone. So right. in order Especially to, this person. to offend anyone, I, I need to make sure I spend my time with people who don't get offended by the things right. that I say. Or even the least offensive version of me was still offensive at right. some level so to that person. That's, then, that's, like, that's, I, that's, right? That's I just, like, know right, it's, it's, uh, and I'm and I'm not choosing, right? Like you said, like, I genuinely care about people. I want people's rights. So I'm like, oh, I'm making this executive decision for their own well-being more than, right? Because they're not saying, because I know they roll their eyes. I know they're, and they're a really good person. And I, you know, sure. I really, really do respect that person. Um, but I, at a certain point, I had to like, just like, mm, I, 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 like I'm doing a, I'm doing us both a favor. And, and right. And giving ourselves the right to do that. So, so, so those of you who are listening, I would love, I'm sure both of us would love to have some feedback on the conversation today in any way, shape or form, what thoughts came up, what, what discomforts came up, what buttons got pushed. I'd love to hear some feedback. You know where to reach us. It's uh, either you winning life on Instagram or Jason Wasser LMFT. That one came back out of the blue. Dude, Michael, a whole nother crazy story about social media and being banned or shut down or oh, whatever. Right. A year and a half, my main Instagram account was shut down until it somehow oh, no. magically. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't even doing anything crazy. It wasn't right even doing anything crazy. But yeah. Michael, where can they find you? Where are some places people can reach out and connect with you? Myname.com and from, from my website, there uh, are links to all the social media platforms i'm active on facebook is the one i'm most active on because i'm a facebook generation i'm 1983 and uh yeah yes i was saying instagram is for girls i'm gonna get on instagram and then but then i you know i i got the at the end yeah but it's the facebook i'm most active on and there's a link to my book as well if anybody's interested in in checking that out but yeah michaelserra.com is the place to go to beautiful awesome thanks my man Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the You Winning Life podcast. If you are ready to minimize your personal and professional struggles and maximize your potential, we would love it if you subscribed so you don't miss an episode. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at You Winning Life.